a bit about my background. I have some uh, research uh, background in analytics and in data science, uh, including time series research. Uh, I am currently working together with the team on some privacy uh, initiatives, as well as cybersecurity and uh, threat intelligence. Those are my main focuses. So without further ado, um, this is going to be in a nutshell what we talk about when we're talking about artificial intelligence. It's nothing but uh, a computer system that's trying to make life easier for us, uh, that's able to do tasks the way we do it, and at least as good as us, if not better. Uh, so that's the overall idea, the high level um, goal, let's say, of, of achieving artificial intelligence. And there's a lot of work, there's a lot of research, uh, a lot of um, innovation coming from this field. So it's a very good time to have this talk, to have this conversation, be it you're from an artificial intelligence background or cybersecurity or kind of both. Uh, it's a good time to kind of uh, review and have a chat around um, these topics because all of the technologies you see, all the emerging solutions, everything, they, they all include uh, artificial intelligence to some extent uh, and, and machine learning algorithms behind the scenes. Uh, I will get to each of those uh, and I will cover um, exactly what I mean by machine learning, deep learning, so on and so forth. And I'll have a couple of slides on, on each of them. Uh, so this is how I generally start the talk. Um, so this is essentially the, the, at this point of the talk, I, I would ask you as to what you see on the screen. Uh, however, just to avoid disruption and to not have everyone talk over each other, I'm, I'm just going to fill you in on what the motive is. So I'm going to ask you uh, in a mock scenario what this picture is. And then as you would have it, you would say it's a dinosaur, it's a Tyrannosaurus Rex, et cetera, et cetera different opinions, different uh, answers to this. <clears throat> All correct, yeah, it's a dinosaur. Uh, but the objective of having this slide is to kind of get you thinking about how the brain processes and how we as human beings uh, do this in real time. So when asked about what this picture is and what you see on the screen and you come up with the answer, a dinosaur, so this is what is happening essentially behind the scenes. Uh, we have our senses. We have our brain, of course, a central processing unit, which puts all of this together. And of course, our memories, which is, again, part of the brain. But this is um, existing data, let's say, based on our past experiences, our, the movies that we may have seen, the kind of conversations we might have had in, in grade school, and uh, the knowledge that has been shared to us at a previous time. So putting all this together, our senses, our central processing unit, and our existing data, our memories, we are able to make an educated guess, make uh, an intelligent behavior, and come up with the answer that it is, of course, a dinosaur or, or a T-Rex or so forth. So this is essentially going to be, um, let's say, the foundation of the talk. So these are the four parameters that is involved in every artificial intelligence systems and they're just replaced uh, by sensors where we have our senses, um, eyesight, touch, feel, um, taste, hearing, etc. By the way guys, um, uh, popular opinion is that we just have five senses. Uh, that is however not true. We have upwards of, I, I believe the recent one uh, I came across was around 21. So of course we do have five basic senses, but in addition to that, we have a lot more senses such as proprioception, which is kind of knowing where things are, your, your place in space and time. Like in the instance that you see a cup and you close your eyes and you can still kind of have an idea of where that cup resides. And you can pick that cup up with your hand without actually seeing where your hand is or seeing where the cup is. So that's proprioception and um, uh, so on and so forth. They're, they're upwards of, of around 21 senses uh, currently uh, to current research. So of course, five senses plus a lot more. Um, how does this fit in into artificial intelligence? We have a plethora, way, way too many um, sensors that we get our data in from, from IoT, from uh, big data data sets, um, uh, public platforms, financial data sets, et cetera, et cetera. We, we just have 
we are in, a, in an age where we have more data than than ever before. So it's a great time to start having these conversations and and putting this data together to try and get some um, insight and get some actionable insights out of them, some intelligent behavior out of them. This is the whole point of artificial intelligence, and this is the whole point of machine learning algorithms behind the scenes that's driving artificial intelligence. And these are the four main components that, that do it. Uh, the GPUs and the quantum computers and so on connect the dots together, the, the data coming in, the streaming data coming in from your sensors and your, uh, let's say, training data that's currently existing in your uh, big data databases. So I think it's worthwhile to take a minute to talk about the human brain. Um, which is essentially the smartest thing in the universe. Uh, we are one of a kind species. We, you can see the chart over here. We, we are topping the scales to no end. Like it's us and then another form of uh, chimps, I want to say. The third one is uh, bottlenose dolphins. So there are a lot of brilliant creatures, a lot of very brainy um, biological organisms, let's say, and, and they all kind of um, have gone through a sim similar lineage uh, of evolution to get to this point where they can actually make smart decisions based on existing data, based on their memories and experiences and uh, and so on and so forth that they have had throughout their lives. Uh, and, and the human tops the charts every single time. I mean, we, we have different mechanisms of doing this. We have, we have the EQ, we have uh, IQ, we have different problem solving tests and uh, more often than not, we would find that we are significantly better at doing these tasks than the rest of the species, be it chimps, elephants, cephalopods. They're all brilliant, mind you. They're, they're all equally adapted and equally great at surviving the current landscape, the current environment. Of course, we exist in the same uh, time and space currently. So, so of course, we've all been equally successful at getting to this point. However, humans do this differently. And in the last two million years or so, there's just been an explosion in, in the growth of the human brain size. And there are different theories as to why this is, as to the different kind of challenges and uh, a preference in mates and, and why we go for for intellectual uh, people more often than we do even over brawn uh, uh, certain times. Um, just think to yourselves in, in a point in time where a friend asks you, to help him move or or move a piece of furniture and then changes his or her mind and says, you know what, you're not strong enough, I'm gonna do this. Uh, and you're kind of fine with it, you're, you're okay, you, you say, yeah, fair enough, all right, you can take care of this yourself. However, if someone says this about your intellect, if someone says that, you know what, you're not adept at solving this problem, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna do this myself, that really hurts us, that gets us off guard and, and we start thinking to ourselves as to why is it that this perception of us exists and we try to offset that. We try to uh, do things to uh, make us smarter, to make us seem smarter as well. And, and this isn't a brilliant trait and this is something that's been seen only in humans. This is constant ability to shift and adapt and grow their brain size uh, over, over the last two million years. And it makes sense that any artificial intelligence platform or any machine learning platform is um, kind of centered or at least inspired by the human brain. Um, going into the nitty gritty, um, this isn't, I don't want to say the exact representation. However, this is a good high level idea to just get you up and running and get you up to speed of um, kind of uh, what's the landscape here? So artificial intelligence is the problem that we're trying to solve. It's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to get here by means of uh, machine learning algorithms and deep learning algorithms. So artificial intelligence is the problem itself of uh, cracking intelligence and getting to do tasks as well as a human or even better. Uh, and machine learning is the means to do that. Machine learning is, is um, a series of alg algorithms which try to mimic, which try to kind of cater and um, model the human brain, the human behavior, stats, and uh, different models, different mechanisms to achieve uh, artificial intelligence. Deep learning, again, is uh, previously known in the 90s, 80s, known, known as neural networks, it's not one and the same, kind of very, very similar principles, very, very similar disciplines. 
which is again a form of machine learning. Machine learning again comes in two forms in, in the form of uh, supervised and unsupervised learning. Uh, deep learning being the unsupervised bit of uh, machine learning. Supervised learning includes some human intervention where you may need to kind of help to nudge the system along into what you want it to do, like in the instance of segregating a data set of um, images into, let's say, cats and dogs, you might have to click on a few images or a few cat images and label them as cats for the system to try and recognize uh, the numbers and the patterns behind the scenes which uh, go into deeming this image as a cat image. Uh, however, unsupervised learning does. Hello? Sorry, guys, just some disturbance on the line. Just hang on. Yep. Back. Right. So, as I was saying, um, deep learning being the unsupervised component within machine learning itself. Uh, and we have upwards of, um, it says 150 layers. Uh, I'm sure we've done a lot more than this currently, uh, but it's nothing but uh, different levels of abstraction. It's different levels of input uh from from the data set itself uh, and i'll cover this in in the following slides so you'll know exactly what i'm talking about can you see my slides fine by the way guys there's some disruption just want to make sure if everything is fine can someone confirm if my screen is visible Yes, all right, perfect. Cool, cool. So as I was saying, um, right. So it makes sense to kind of uh, look through the history a bit, and it's just I'm just going to make this point once and move on from it. Um, uh, the whole reason that I wanted to include this slide is because uh, we kind of get a bit ambiguous when we're talking about these terms, and we use them interchangeably: artificial intelligence, machine learning deep learning, data science, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, it's important to remember, however, that the base of it all, the core of it all was from data mining, like back in, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, where we just had a lot of data. I mean, I mean, we have more and more data going into it. Like each day we are producing more data, and today we have more data in the world than we did yesterday, and so on and so forth. Same will ring true for any future uh, uh, time, time, uh, moment in time. Uh, so the crux of it, the, the the center point of it all was data mining. So that's how it all started, where we wanted to um, kind of engage our management information systems and, and uh, kind of pull out information that was there in the data, however, not explicitly. So we needed human means. We needed people to look at that data, draw up charts, um, do manual tasks, basically, to kind of come up with insights, to com come up with information that, that exists in this data. Uh, uh, that already exists in this data. And, and this is what we're doing. We're building on top of this, like the, the biggest buzz buzzword now is, is data science and, and artificial intelligence. It's nothing but an extension, an extended arm of data mining, which we had been doing for, for um, quite a few decades now. Uh, and good to mention as well that they all feed into each other. They're all very closely coupled um, uh, paradigms, let's say, or technologies, and an innovation in one definitely triggers an innovation in the other and so on and so forth. So if you have new up and coming technologies for storing data, be it with uh, different matrices, tensors, quantum computing, whatever, if you have an innovation in one of these three fields, one of these four fields, considering data mining as, as the, uh, the core of it all, uh, it definitely feeds into the others as well. And, and this is how they kind of um, learn and grow from each other. These fields learn and grow from each other. <clears throat> uh, a moment to talk about the levels of artificial intelligence. Um, so we've characterized this in three distinct points, uh, narrow AI, uh, general AI, uh, artificial general intelligence, artificial super intelligence. Uh, we are currently in the second realm here, like just in, sorry about that, just in AGI. We're just about knocking the doors of this. We're kind of, uh, we may already be there. I mean, it, it might be an interesting thought experiment to think about how these um, 
algorithms work behind the scenes and how everything is connected online on the internet. So we may have even achieved this and not actually know about it. Uh, however, we're just about closing in on this, closing in on, on the second wave of uh, artificial intelligence, let's say. The first wave has been done and dusted. We, we've been we've been there for a while now with the IBM Watsons and, and your Siri on your phone and, and many the different plethora of uh, assistant um, technologies that, that's been around for a long time. So this has been done, kind of accomplished that the narrow AI, that they're, they're very good at a specific task. They're very good at doing things. Uh, in a siloed approach. They're not very good at doing things in a problem solving approach. They don't see the broader picture. They don't uh, connect the dots together. You ask them something and then they give feedback on that said something. So done. The second one, the AGI, which is kind of better at problem solving, like more insightful, having uh, some sense, not, not essentially sentient, but having some sense and emotions and, and some feedback mechanisms uh, based on the input it gets. So we're kind of on the clock here. I'm, I'm, uh, previously, the, the study was to be done by 2020. So there are mechanisms in place to try and test this have, if, if and when we have achieved this, if we have achieved this. Uh, however, I think we're, we're right about the corner, around the corner of uh, AGI. Artificial super intelligence is where the machines essentially shoot across the table. Like we have human intelligence, which takes generations to develop, as I mentioned, two million years of evolution trying to get to the, uh, I mean, successfully getting to this size that we have now. Um, however, machines would not need this. So the thing with artificial super intelligence is that once you achieve it, once we have a machine, like let's say person X uh, or or Einstein too. Like for instance, he's the creator of artificial super intelligence, and the machine that he has created, the, the AI that he has created, is just as smart as he is. So, in essence, this person creating this machine that's as smart as him, this machine itself can again create machines that are as smart as the machine itself, if not smarter. And in the next instance the intelligence of the machines would just shoot over. And this is the uh, the singularity. This is the, the point where machines could possibly may be a lot smarter than hum humans. And they would do this at an astronomical rate. They would just hit, hit it and then the next day they're gone. Like we are nothing to them. Because uh, human intelligence, of course, depends on breeding and, and mating and, and evolution. So you are dependent on generations, like 30 to 40 years between between one generation to the next to get kind of slight minimalistic improvements in intelligence. However, machines are not bound by this. They can just shoot up the very next second because they're silicone and they're all connected on the internet and so on and so forth. So this is the point that um, we need to kind of watch out for. Uh, is this possible? Uh, it sounds when, when I talk about this, it sounds a lot like, um, I don't know, science fiction out of the movies, I robot, what have you. But there is some truth to it. Like this is an impending thing. Like it's going to happen. Um, this is a study from uh, 2013 where the most published researchers in AI and, and data science and data mining uh, were asked if this point is possible, if the singularity is possible to have uh, machines smarter than humans. And as you would imagine, a lot of them overwhelmingly said that yes, it is possible, and not just that, it's possible in a lifetime, in, in possibly in our lifetime. So, but by the year 2070, which is like 50 years from now, with a 90% confidence, we're, we're going to get there. So, this is just in the works, it's going to happen, and it's on the clock now. Uh, and this, of course, includes 21% of people who said uh, that this would never happen. However, I feel like this is a study from 2013, and if we had this poll again and asked these same people, they would still be on the clock now as well, because it just makes sense that we are we are going to get there. We're definitely going to get there. It's just a question a question of when. So, how do we know if we have gotten there? This is Alan Turing. Uh, if you don't know who that is, there is a movie called The Imitation Game. I strongly recommend you watch it if you haven't already. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant scientist, uh, mathematician. He's known as the father of encryption, uh, father of AI. He's just been 
a stalwart in, in the field of uh, of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and encryption. Uh, so the test is essentially uh, this is again, mind you, back in the fifties. Um, so the test was essentially centered around a human being having a conversation with the said AI, uh, and having this conversation over text, like this would ring a bell with a lot of you, um, chatbots, so on and so forth. Um, and judging whether or not this chatbot, this this entity that you're chatting with is actually human. And of course, the machines can lie, the chatbots can can uh, fabricate data and they can make things up and as, as humans would. So the goal of it is to have a machine that's smart enough to make a human think that it is a human itself. So we've kind of achieved this already. I feel like a lot of the chatbots, a lot of the technology that we currently have in place is to a great deal of success can dupe a lot of us into believing that we are actually on the line with a machine. So to an extent, I feel like we've kind of achieved this. However, there is room for improvement in the test itself because mind you, the test was again uh, from a scientist back in the 50s. So so it's a work in progress. It's, it's a thing that uh, needs more development to get to uh, artificial super intelligence. A moment to talk about um, the algorithms and the, and the problems with uh, data science and artificial intelligence, exactly what it's doing to be intelligent and what it's doing to accomplish these tasks. And uh, one of the major uh, concerns for that, one of the major research areas for that is classification, which is nothing but um, labeling, essentially, labeling uh, items into discrete chunks. So uh, in the case of a spam classification system, you would have a system that uh, filters out spam and classifies an email as spam or not spam, or uh, for uh, antivirus engines, it would be uh, malicious, non-malicious, so on and so forth. The idea of it is to just um, have an object, uh, have a data field uh, that is not previously labeled, uh, drawing up on previous experiences. Of course, you can have supervised and unsupervised learning depending on uh, the kind of algorithms that's working behind the scenes. But the end goal of it is to classify that object into the right box. Uh, if it is, uh, let's say, a, a system for classifying cats and dogs, you want to rightly label the cats as cats and rightly label the dogs as dogs. And same for spam, same for uh, antivirus engines, and same for SIM technologies, etc., threat intelligence, so on and so forth. And they work, they have just a range of different applications and then they work from everything uh, from Netflix to your YouTube ads to uh, time series and motif discovery, be it uh, uh, classifying heart attacks or classifying bird songs, like which birds have a similar bird song to the other and which birds might have inherited traits from uh, previous ancestors, let's say, of, of their bird song. And, and this has many, many applications in, in network analytics, uh, behavior analytics, uh, segregating network traffic, and just everything, everything. Uh, and this is one of the major um, studies in the field of artificial intelligence and data science. And the other one, um, well, an extension to classification itself, we hear a lot about systems that are robust, systems that have no false positives, zero false positives, and and um, just the highest accuracy, 99.999% accuracy and so forth. I would like to take a minute here to just highlight as to how this is done. This is a confusion matrix. So as you can see here, you have something as the predicted value and as the actual value. So taking into account the spam, not spam example, so in the instance that we have an email that is a suspect email, uh, we are not sure, we are not certain if it is malicious, not malicious, spam, not spam, whatever. And the goal of the system is to uh, correctly classify it as, as such. And you would do this, of course, by uh, means of intervention. Uh, the people themselves, if it's a training uh, data set, you would know that this is spam or you would know that this is not spam. So it has an inherent actual value. So it is either positive spam or negative, not spam. That's the actual value. And of course, the system to, to test the accuracy of the system, uh, you would need to 
kind of assess the actual value with the predicted value. So in the instance that you have a predicted value that this is spam, it's 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 positive, and in actuality, you see that it is not spam. It's it's from a contact. It's it's from a colleague of yours or whatever, and the actual result of it is negative but the classification from the system is positive. So then you have it fall under this category. You have it fall under a false positive. As in, the system deemed it as positive, the system deemed it as spam, but it is in fact not spam. So it is important to mention that all of these quadrants, like of course I have just mentioned it in colors and just in words. However, these have numbers associated with it. They have percentages as to how accurate it is, How how many in a, in a trial of um, um, a million emails or, or 100,000 emails, how many of this falls in the first quadrant? How many of them are actual true positives? It is a malicious email and the system deemed it as a malicious email. How accurate is this? And we have so on and so forth for the rest of the uh, quadrants as well. In the same 100,000 sample set, how many of these does the system get wrong? Mind you, a lot of the times having a very low uh, again, these all feed into each other. So if you have a low false positive rate, you could have a higher false negative rate and so on and so forth. Uh, so there, there are mechanisms to tweaking the system into being more prone towards a false negative or being more prone towards a false positive. Uh, and there are um, implications for this. Uh, in the instance of a surveillance camera, uh, ca uh, camera in, in the airports, and you have an unattended baggage and, and you want to classify that as a uh, IED and improvised explosive device or something, a, a bag that's been unattended for a while, and you want your system, your artificial intelligence system, to classify this bag as such, as, as, as a malicious object, as, as a possible bomb, as a possible IED, what, what have you. So in that case, you could be tolerant of the fact that if it is in fact a false positive, <clears throat> If the system for in the instance that, that it deems the object as a threat and classifies it as such, excuse me guys. Apologies, right through it. Um, <clears throat> so in the event that it is deemed as a false positive, as in the bag is said to be a threat, however, it is not in fact a threat. You're kind of okay with it. You're kind of okay with uh, having your your airport officials, your yeah, uh, your security staff going into that object, checking it out, and seeing that yeah, everything is good. It's fine. It's just luggage. There's clothes in there. It's fine. Someone must have left it. Fine. Just put it in the lost and found. It's good. So you are tolerant of the fact that it is okay to have a false positive. However, under no circumstances are you to have a false negative. Under no circumstances do you want your surveillance system to scan in on a bag, to see that it's been un unattended for a while, and the system spits out a value as negative, as it is not a threat, when in fact it is actually a threat. It is an IED and it may have consequences. It probably would have consequences. Uh, human lives are at stake. So it is important to notice and make a mental note of this that a, a low false positive rate isn't necessarily always the best thing it's it's a great thing when it comes to spam it comes to uh antivirus software your sim solutions your threat intelligence platforms it's great to have a low false positive rate however it does make sense to take a minute or two to kind of look behind the scenes as to what the system does why it has the low false positive rate and how accurate it is in getting the true true positives right Uh, another focus for this paradigm, uh, aside from uh, classification, is of course clustering, which is kind of similar to classification in, in the sense that you, you want to have objects in, in discrete chunks. You want to have uh, them clustered into, into two distinct groups, let's say. So that's what clustering is. It's in the word. Um, and there are two types of doing this. You have partitional uh, clustering and you have hierarchical clustering. Partitional clustering is nothing but just hard boundaries between the objects, spam, not spam, dog, not dog, cat, um, Katie did, flower, uh, gorilla, uh, so on and so forth. You just want to have uh, groups of items, similar groups put together in the same chunk and dissimilar groups put in another chunk or classified as such. 
And of course, you have different metrics and different mechanisms to uh, make these system systems work at a very granular level into training them into, into recognizing images, recognizing uh, time series, recognizing uh, financial data, stock markets, et cetera, et cetera. There's different mechanisms of doing this. And uh, hierarchical clustering is a bit different in the sense that um, it does group similar objects to get together. Uh, as you can see here, visually the cat and the tiger being more, um, let's say similar, similar objects to one another, the elephant and the mammoth being similar. And then of course a fruit being very dissimilar, very different from all of these uh, other four uh, objects in your data set. So hierarchical clustering is uh, an excellent way of doing this is, is by dendrograms. The, the, the tree-like structure that you see here is called a dendrogram. And the height between each node, like um, the difference between the, the elephant and mammoth and the difference between the kitten and the tiger is uh, signified by the, the height of the distance, the, 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 the black rod that you see here. That is how dissimilar these objects are from one another. So it's a hierarchical clustering. There is a relation between these objects and the heights between the nodes and the heights between the, the tree itself, the, the leaf nodes, signifies as to how dissimilar these objects are from one another. Uh, and a great way of doing this is from, from um, speciation, and, and we do this in genetics all the time. Uh, this is a screen cap from a web page called uh, onezoom.org. Uh, this is essentially a page that you can just go into and it tells you exactly uh, the tree of life, like what species originated from what other predecessor species. So you have, as you can see, the leaf nodes here. You can go on each one of them individually and see exactly what their ancestral lineage was. And this is a great way of um, representing hierarchical clustering. Um, it's good to take a minute or two to kind of discuss um, how this works in, in a practical scenario. So I mentioned recommendation systems uh, and classification and so on and so forth. So one of the earlier algorithms for, for Netflix and how they kind of um, suggested movies to one another, like in, in the example, the, the example table here, Alex and Bob, is to have uh, to maintain a data set of nothing but ones and zeros of the movies or, or the, the titles, the TV show titles that they may or may not have watched uh, as represented on the screen here. One being watched and zero being not watched and so forth. So as we can see here, uh, under the movie Titanic, both Alex and Bob have watched it. Legally Blonde, Alex has not, Bob has. A uh, lot of the rings too, they both have, so on and so forth. So you have this kind of very neat and elegant data set, let's say, of, of, of movies and uh, knowledge about the fact that Alex and Bob, have they watched this movie or not? And essentially, uh, one of the earlier algorithms of how this worked was by using something called a Jacquard similarity, which is nothing but um, an accuracy measurement, uh, sorry, a similarity measurement between Alex and Bob considering Alex's movies set 101101 uh, of, of, of the movies that he has seen and comparing it with Bob's movie set, the union of the sets. So in the intersection that you have between Alex and Bob, we see that Titanic, they've both watched Titanic. Lord of the Rings too, we've seen that they've both watched this movie. The Matrix, we see that both of them have not watched it. The Exorcist, again, so on and so forth. So these are the intersections. So you want to count up exactly how many intersections there are, how many similarities there are between Alex and Bob. And you divide that simply by the number of observations that you have in the table, the number of movies in your in your data set. Uh, with the intention of, all right, in, in, in this case, we have five intersections and two dissimilarities, which is uh, your speed and legally blonde. <clears throat> in, in these two dissimilarities, you just draw up a percentage, which, which would be five matches divided by seven number of movies would be five over seven. That's how similar Alex is to Bob. And it gives you a percentage five by seven times 100 gives you gives you a percentage. And you can say to this percentage, to this extent, Alex is similar to Bob. And based on this knowledge, based on this information, you can, of course, suggest titles to one another. You can tell Alex, you know what, go ahead. You haven't watched Legally Blonde. 
this is a good suggestion for you. Watch Legally Blonde and you can go back to Bob and say that you haven't watched uh, Speed, so you may want to check that title out based on the analytics that has gone behind the scenes and the the numbers that has been crunched uh, by the Netflix engines. Mind you, again, this is a, this is a very basic example. This is, uh, of course, not how things work currently, but this was, I believe, one of the earlier versions of um, how it used to work. It's just to give you an idea of um, how it all goes on in a practical setup. So the building blocks of uh, artificial intelligence and data science in general, data sets. So you have objects, rows and columns. You've seen this in Excel. Uh, you, if you work in the field, you've, you've used R, you've used MATLAB, you've used uh, Python, so on and so forth. Uh, this is exactly what it looks like. So you have your rows across you, which are the, the objects themselves, which could be, um, I've taken an example from Kaggle. Uh, Kaggle is a data science website where you can just log in and you have uh, different publicly available web uh, and publicly available data sources for for Formula One, COVID nineteen, um, cancer research, uh, cybersecurity, you name it. It's it's all there and it's all publicly available. You can download it and you can play around with it on Excel. You can play around with it on R and so on and so forth, as you like. So uh, this is just to let you know that this is what it is. We've all seen it. This is what the databases look like. Again, this is a very simplistic version of how data is actually stored in the databases themselves. We have something called TensorFlows and we have different mechanisms of uh, making very, very efficient use of the rows and columns and redundancies and similarities to kind of map these into different objects and different different uh, features. So the columns themselves are the features. As you can see here, the number, code, forename, surname, etc. cetera, are, are, are the uh, the attributes of the object and the rows themselves are the the objects, which could be in this case. I've taken uh, an example of uh, the circuits, the Formula One circuits and Formula One uh, drivers. So the rows are the drivers and circuits and the columns are the things that describe the driver or the circuit. Very simple. This is the building blocks of uh, any kind of analytics you want to you want to build on any kind of data you want to build on. So speaking of Formula One, um, let's take an example, a deep learning example for uh, for um, uh, aut automatic driving or, or the self-driven cars that we have now currently. Again, this is a very simplistic example just to give you an idea. So this is how you have it. This is your data set right here that you see uh, labeled as training data and you have categorical forms of data. You have shape and you have colors. Uh, most of these cases in neural nets and such you would find numeric data, you would find real numbers which uh, uh, work with math and uh, algorithms and stats behind the scenes to kind of connect the dots and uh, drive your classification and drive your action output from it. This is, however, a categorical example data. So you have uh, your shapes and your colors and the objective of this task is to recognize a stop sign and get the self-driven car to stop at the stop sign. So you have something called features, uh, which is the shape and the color, and you have the labels, which is of course uh, the classification item itself, as, as I mentioned previously, spam, not spam, bomb, not bomb, uh, cat, not cat, so on, so on. So in the instance that the features uh, in this data set, in, in, in the camera data set, let's say of the car, is uh, an octagon, and the colors are red and white. And you classify that as a stop sign. So this is how you connect the dots behind the scenes uh, with the features and you assign a label to it. In this case, it would be octagon. It would be red and white and the system would classify that uh, that shape, that object as a stop sign. And then that label itself would be tied together with an action item uh, with a T1 that you see here would be a task one, which could be in the case of a stop sign, it would be to stop the car, of course. So this is how it works uh, behind the scenes. So moving on to AI in cyber defense. Very similar. Uh, we have the same four components. We have sensors. We have uh, the brain of it all, <coughs> the quantum computers, the modeling algorithms, so on. And of course, the, the data that comes in. Uh, and 
we want to have an action on top of that, which is of course your intelligent behavior, the output that you're looking to get from the system. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the first use case, a threat intelligence. Uh, this is a great up and coming field, a lot of innovation, a lot of technology, a lot of investment going into this. Uh, myself personally, uh, have some plans here for the team uh, and the division over the next year, a couple of years uh, with relation to threat intelligence. So if you're interested, please do stay in touch. If you're early career, we may have some opportunities in the future. Uh, so yeah, definitely feel free to reach out to me regarding this topic. Um, so artificial intelligence in line with uh, threat intelligence. So these are the parameters. These are kind of the, the inputs that you have. You have your, your, your technology platforms, you have your social platforms, you have your dark web, uh, you have your SIM technologies, uh, and it's kind of all feeding into one another and, and learning from one another in the attempt of getting actionable insights in the attempt of, of outputting some intelligent behavior that we can work around, that we can block a certain port number, we can uh, flag a certain system, we can patch a certain system, so on and so forth, all based on data, existing data. Some of these cases in dark web and social and so on, and mind you, this would be some form of supervised learning because you would need a SOC analyst, you would need a SOC engineer, to kind of look at these feeds and do some sanitization before they kind of feed into your SIM technology. And then you would want to work around that to kind of come up with uh, actionable insights, the kind of um, output that you would expect to have from the SIM technologies and, and help you guide your investigation or help you guide your uh, threat hunting activities, let's say. So this is it. The sensor is, of course, um, diverse set of inputs from dark web to social to etc. You have a plethora of different inputs, different uh, mechanisms for getting data into your platform. Uh, big data databases, you have threat intelligence feeds, you have uh, open source as well as paid intelligence feeds where, where you have people just doing this online for a living, just looking at uh, the threat landscape, just looking at actors, looking at nation states and their activities as to what kind of cyber, um, let's say, activities they're getting into and what kind of industries they might have uh, an impact on. And these are the actionable insights that you get from it, being it, be it a risk rating or be it some form of uh, output that you want to get from uh, closing a certain port number or upgrading a certain system. Similarly, we have for um, our security operations are SOCs as well. We have different components, siloed components, threat detection, ticketing, threat uh, analysis and reporting, so on and so forth. Different siloed components, of course, very, very closely coupled and very, very closely um, working together, let's say in an ecosystem that your SOC engineers are keeping a track on. They're looking at real-time analytics and different data sources and, and coming up with insights and, and learning from this data and, and tailoring their, uh, let's say, AI systems to perform better. We have similar use cases for UEBA as well. This is again a field that's right with uh, analytics and a lot of uh, AI innovation in this keeping track of users' behavior and your kind of time of login, the kind of systems you're accessing, the the the, the rights and the access associ associated with it, the privilege level that you're using to, to access these systems. And that there are many, many solutions uh, that play into this market space and, and, and kind of develop on this that uh, very closely couple cybersecurity as well as artificial intelligence uh, to put all the data together and give you actionable insights on, on uh, drawing the baseline. Essentially, you want to have a baseline that your employees kind of follow and stick to and be around uh, the ballpark of, of acceptable behavior. And whenever you have an anomaly, such as an untimely login or, or a different uh, privilege level than you're usually um, uh, accustomed to or, or uh, used to using, then these are events that the system flags and it kind of warns the 
admin, let's say the admin portal, that, that you, this is not the kind of behavior you want to see, and you may want to take action against this at a future time or uh, or stop this uh, stop this behavior as it's happening in real time. And of course, uh, the different sensors, we have it from chatbots, SMS, your, your log files, and just different, different platforms of, of data coming into it. And, and the different uh, solution providers for UEBA have uh, different mechanisms of achieving this. But all in all, it's the same landscape. It's these same four components uh, feeding off of each other to uh, make intelligent decisions. And finally, um, a use case for EDR as well. More of the same uh, siloed solutions, bridge together, close to close together, um, a couple together with with uh, human intelligence, with human initiatives, with threat hunting, with uh, uncovering new and emerging threat actors, so on and so forth. Different data sources, different sensors, all feeding into an ecosystem of your your SOC, SOC centers and uh, and your SOC engineers and giving you actionable insights on uh, closing the gaps and, and having a better, more mature security posture. A minute to look at the numbers. Um, so I've talked a lot about artificial intelligence and its abilities and how uh, we are just about knocking the doors of getting into something really interesting in terms of artificial intelligence. However, how does that impact the human life? How does that impact our employability and our skill set and, and the landscape, the work life uh, landscape for us as individuals? So as you can see here, um, more than half of the democracies, the advanced democracies in the world already have AI surveillance systems, a uh, whole new can of worms to talk about privacy and the human life and what is owned by us versus what is public. Uh, just just a whole new debate, just a whole new topic to discuss, but this is now, it's happening as we speak. 68% uh, of tech companies are okay with reskilling. They want to reskill their employees, they want to invest in AI, they want to invest in AI trainings and have their employees up to speed with such technology so that they can merge with one another and uh, to the best of their abilities, feed the AI technologies and learn from them. And sorry, hang on. Yep. As I was saying, so learn from one another and just be in a collaborative environment where we are progressing day by day. We as individuals doing better in our jobs and the AI as the AI doing better at connecting the dots and giving us insights to drive our operations. 34% of employees uh, feel that their jobs would be automated in the next three years. It's probably accurate. I, I would assume that yeah, around 30%, at least a quarter of the jobs currently would kind of be automated in the next three years. However, this feeds, back, uh, feeds us back into the second point here that constantly upskilling, reskilling, and, and, and investing in these technologies and being current and up to date with these uh, platforms. And 69%, if you're already in management, great news for you. Uh, you're going to save up a massive chunk of your time uh, due to innovation and uh, uh, investment in technology such as AI. In the year 2024, about 70% of your workload would be just taken care of by chatbots and, and, and things that are uh, non-human assistance. So great news all in all. Uh, a minute to talk about the Ingram Edge, and this is kind of what we do. Uh, we have uh, zero cost to partners. If So if you're a partner, if you would like to know more about this, please reach out to us. We do something called a Cybergram, which is an online self-assessment tool. It gives you uh, a cybersecurity assessment um, of your landscape, of your maturity. It's a questionnaire. You go out and fill out a couple of questions, and then at the end of it, it gives you very tailored responses based on uh, uh, on your inputs to the system and gives you exact remediation or at least high-level remediation actions that you could take to better mature your uh, cybersecurity posture. 
Uh, and we have similarly something called a discovery report, which is nothing but reconnaissance. So if you're a partner and you, you have an end customer who um, you want to kind of arrange a meeting with and you want to kind of start a dialogue with for, for new opportunities, uh, uh, we are here to help. We do this reconnaissance activity. It's completely non-intrusive. It is not a penetra penetration test. It is just um, sifting through some public platforms, looking online, um, some basic Google hacking, and in certain cases, some some uh, dark web monitoring as well. In, in in very limited cases, if if we are um, requested to do such, but this comes up with with a very um, let's say interesting report about the customer, which you can take with yourself to the customer and tell them, dear Mr. Customer, this is what I, what we have found about your about your public uh, persona, about your public network, your web server, so on and so forth, your public facing uh, infrastructure. And these are kind of the things that you may want to look into. And these are kind of the things that you may want to uh, close in, close the gaps on. And we are here to help and we are here to uh, help you achieve that. So of course we do this uh, with zero cost to you. So uh, Cybergram is just an online platform. I am cybergram.com. Um, and uh, uh, the discovery report, you just reach out to us on our mailbox, cyber.meta at ingramicro.com. Finally, closing comments. Um, we've seen a lot of doom and gloom currently. It's not been the best of time for the years. Uh, it's not been a good time by any means, not even been a mediocre time. Uh, so I would like to end on a high note. Um, there is a lot of innovation. There's a lot of movement when it com comes to AI and cybersecurity. So if you're in the domain, if you're working in anything remotely close to one of these, or even if you have uh, some insight into this, you're at the right place at the right time. Like it's no better time than ever to be in this field. Uh, as you can see, the current landscape, the, the amount of data that we have now is more than we have ever had. And I mentioned this at the start as well. This is true for each day as it passes. And um, I believe it was 44 zettabytes that was um, the number for 2020, which is insane, which is just an incredible number, like 44 to the 10 to the 21st. That's an immense amount of data. Just to put things into perspective, 10 to the 21st, that's the number of stars that we have in the observable universe. So that's all the stuff. That's the stuff that we can, we've observed so far in our lives and, and that's massive. So that's a lot of data, a lot of interesting insights to be drawn from this data and drive our cybersecurity, drive our uh, analytics and drive our databases. So it's just an amazing time. It's an incredible time to be playing to this field. Um, with that, that would be my closing statement. Thank you all very much again for joining. That is it from me. If you have any questions, comments, please feel free to have a discussion. Uh, if you have something that you would like to put on the chat box, you can do that as well. Uh, once again, thank you so, so very much for joining me. Any questions or comments? I think we're good. So we have a couple of minutes, guys. Um, I'm here till three, so I'm just going to put myself on mute. And in case you have any questions or comments, please, please feel free to put it on the chat box. Jad, thank you for attending. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, have a great rest of the day.